Um, so before we go into how extreme open science can be and test the waters there as an example, as an experiment like Jenny said, um, I would like to perhaps take you to two slides where we try to frame the problem, what we try to solve, right? Why is it so hard to crack the problem or the challenge of, this, uh, of drug discovery? So very simply, we just don't know human biology. When we look at that picture like this, give them headaches, you take your paracetamol, and yet today we don't know what the molecular mechanisms behind it. We have some ideas, but they're not being validated. Uh, also, think about dementia. We've been talking about dementia for a long time. It's been characterized for about almost 100 years, and yet we have not come with anything to crack that. Or perhaps bipolar. Again, I'm not saying that the picture inspires me. But uh, bipolar disorder is still many times treated with lithium, which is not even a compound. It's an element. We really know biology. On top of that, we have another challenge, which is that us as scientists, we all love our cozy, safe projects. And most of the time, we go over and over the same targets again. And if you do a quick analysis, we will say, no, don't worry. We are academics. We are full of ideas. We will definitely pave all these places that no one, industry especially, is, do, is not doing. Now, some of my colleagues did a very interesting uh, uh, bibliographic analysis. Kinases are very important targets. Many of the anti-cancer drugs target kinases. We know there are about 520 kinases in the human genome. And guess what? When you ask PubMed, each one of the kinases that we know are mapped in the human genome, and how many papers have the name of that kinase, the title, or abstract? This is how it looks like. Amazing, isn't it? 90% of all the work ever done revolves on less than 50 of those kinases. Yes, and that trend continues. Even though you have certain spots of data showing driver mutations, map on different kinases, RNA interference uh, experiments, and yet we work again and again on the same ones. P30A, for instance, I think there are more papers than the number of atoms in the kinase domain of that protein. You think that is bad? Well, let's see what the industry is doing, what patent is doing. What is the patenting? What does the industry do? They wait for some work to be done because they want to build on safe ground. And lo and behold, what is activity around commercial patentable activity around uh, those kinases? It's still the same, right? It's a bad circle. There are many reasons why I believe this happens, but I don't think we have time to go there today. We can perhaps take that out during the discussion. Um, but, and I'll point that a little kind is there, which I'll talk to you about later on. So what we said we could perhaps do, what the SGC said, how can we approach this? We know there's a lot of duplication. And duplication is done on the same targets, where papers are not even sharing the data. And we know there's a big problem with data reproducibility. Things that we read out there, interpretation of research, not the data themselves. No one can actually cross-validate that. So we said, why do we do something different? Why don't we start by cracking and solving protein structures of genes, proteins that no one's working on, so they're mapped zone, uh, actually do it at high throughput. So the SGC actually, as a glance, uh, started operations in June 2004. And of course, we have Welcome as one of the leading founders. Uh, and now we have different government agencies, for instance, Genome Canada. We have Government Ontario. We have even Brazilian research uh, charity uh, found the foundation funding this effort. Uh, we do have uh, Innovation Canada, IMI, the European effort. But as Jenny mentioned, we have up to 10 farmers. They're not putting in kind. They're putting real cash. Real cash to do what? To do research led by different chief scientists across six of the labs across the globe. That brings together teams of medchems, structural biologists, uh, geneticists, disease foundations, clinical scientists from hospitals. And everybody has one common ethos. Everything is under our open science policy. And when we say open, we really mean it. There's no ifs and buts. Everything that SGC done, has done is promptly, that means no delay, 
put in public domain as soon as it crossed a uh, quality barrier. Uh, not only the results and the data, we put also all the reagents we develop. It's not just, believe me, if you do the experiment, you get this. We give them the tools. So anybody can try to validate with the tools. And we have no restrictions. We don't say, here's the tool, but you can only do it if you share something back with me. No, it's yours. Do whatever you like. Just don't eat it. That is that in our MTA. Just don't give it to humans. But to get access to our probes, you just click on the website. And that's a click MTA. I accept, we send. No patents or any output. We think it's a waste of time and actually effort. Instead of actually holding things back, you should be going out making discoveries because it's all new. We don't know what those genes are doing. I'll give you a quick example of a study that happened uh, within the SGC. Uh, nowadays, everybody talks about epigenetics. Epigenetics through uh, uh, control of different epigenetics regulators. Back then, very few people knew what bromine domain regulators do. Now they're one of the hottest targets in the field. But back then, July 2009, well, we were working with GSK. They said, well, perhaps you should look into this family. Might be interesting. Oh, by the way, there's an old patent uh, published by Mitsubishi uh, a farmer. But I think you have to find this Japanese. So we found some Japanese people, dug it out, managed to crack it, look at the paper, and we started solving, tried to solve all the Brom domains that exist in the human genome. 61 Brom domains, SGC solved about 35, high throughput, quickly, bang. With that, we could start designing compounds that were more specific to one target. And once that was designed, we sent it out. We start calling who actually has a disease which is linked to this gene, which we don't know what it does. But now we have a compound which is specific. I can turn that down. So we found this guy, Jay Bradner, at Dana Farber, who is now running Novartis. And Jay Bradner said, well, there's this cancer called nut midline carcinoma. Very few people have heard of it. He had access to patients. Quick, once you have diagnosis, it's probably six months of life. And we tested the compound with a fusion protein that actually brings BRD4 into another, with another gene called nut, terrible name. But if you dose it, what you see here is that when you dose with the compound JQ1, the tumor stops growing. Quickly, we published in Nature. And we told everybody, if you like, we give you the powder. You can test anything. Because I'm telling you that powder hits BRD4. What other diseases can it hit? We don't know. But different disease specialists can do that. So very quickly, look, since we started the work, to enter collaboration with Jay, about six months. Then we called Jay, and he actually said, oh, should we bring the lawyers in for the MTA? I said, no. Here, take it. Whole work validation, writing the paper submission, review, 11 months. Super compression. A month later, more than 100 labs have actually said, can we have a bit of this powder? And they start testing. And started to come up with all this interesting paper. Why? Disease experts in different disease areas in biology started testing the compound to see whether BRD4 is involved in that disease or not. And very quickly had a multiplication of data, which was then quickly validated. One of our pharma partners, Pfizer, they said, oh, it might be off-target effect. Your compound might be hitting one of the other 20,000 genes, proteins. They generate another compound, different chemotype, and say, Community, take this for free, as you see distributing. They did validation. It is the same target. It's not off target effect. And from there on, so much data came in. Less than three years later, GSK here, who didn't know anything about the biology, which disease to take into, they say, thank you, community. We've seen enough. We've taken this target into oncology. And what happened since then? So this is somewhat old story, but I think it illustrates well because we can track what happened to the community. Remember, this is an open tool, no patent, no restriction. You see it out there, and what happens? Different companies started to say, wow, a great tool. We can start testing different disease models. And quickly, you have all these different companies filing their own version of the molecule into different disease pair groups, and you see timelines there. And this is the last uh, 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 
accounted that we did in 2017. Since the compound was put in public domain, there were more than 40, four, zero, clinical trials registered in clinicaltrials.gov. That added long together, if you add all the rough, you know, if these are oncology uh, trials, how much that added up? It's actually more than $1.5 billion of private investment built on top of one open, known patent molecule. But open is actually very interesting. It's not only about making medicine. We can actually start thinking more on the open side of the world, on the science side of the world. We can start opening it up and working with other experts that can help us push the cause forward. So one of the most exciting groups that we worked with in the, in, at the SGC are the disease foundations. Why? Just as Frank already mentioned in some of his uh, previous uh, discussions we had, Disease foundations, they don't have, or now we don't have a career in academia. We don't have to hang papers. We don't have to have uh, uh, um, our impact factor. We don't have to have uh, the, the tenure, okay? The ultimate goal of all disease foundations is to crack the problem. It's not the market size. It is something that they believe, something that their beneficiaries really need. And what really is missing for these people for disease foundations and patients is a treatment. But another thing is time. And that's why we decided to call the program Inpatient, because we will all be patient one day. It's just a matter of time. It's inescapable. But should we wait until that arrives so we can start acting? So we had all these different research projects with different disease foundations. And I'm telling you, I will tell you a story of two of them and how they are very nicely linked together. Another one of our maps uh, how research was pushed. This is an ultra rare disease called uh, Stone Man Syndrome, fibrodysplasia dysplasia or Sificans progressiva. Geneticists found that one mutation, one single mutation that changes six atoms in the kinase called ACVR1 leads to this. It turns muscle slowly to connective tissue into bone. We don't know why, but it does that. As sequencing gets cheaper, you start having many of this sequencing data coming in. But who is trying to really understand what these proteins are doing? They need groups like the SGC, for instance, and others who will say, we can take that gene, we can express, we can solve the structure, we can do some test functional assays. And my colleague, Alex Bullock, did just that and found out that, hey, interesting, these mutations actually are gain of function. The mutation increases activity of the kinase. Perfect. This is a case where we can design a compound to shut the kinase down. Instead of doing it on his, on his own, he starts sharing this, working in collaboration with colleagues, and coming up with new chemical series, which is always put in public domain. We always share this, and testing the animal models. It works. Now that we have an assay, a model, and understand how it works, Alex went and started looking for open compounds start screening a lot of them that are in the public domain, and what did he find? He find that thing there, that is circled in red. What is that it? Hmm, that is a molecule called saracatinib from AstraZeneca's open innovation collection. It hits the kinase well, it is potent, it's selective, and it was already a clinical stage, uh, phase two clinical trial compound, so it's safe. What happens now? For something that is only one in two million, patients for which there's no economic incentive whatsoever for anybody to develop any medicine for these kids. And if you happen to have this in the family, sorry, it's just a very, very terrible situation. These kids have to decide when they're teenagers whether they would like to be locked standing, sitting. They have to decide. At one stage, they have to decide whether they want their jaws locked shut or open so they can be fed. Right? And life expectation, 40 years. But in six, we move from no, no expectation, to perhaps design a clinical trial. And I can tell you now that Alex has gone and started asking money for the European Commission. And we have very good signs that the clinical trial with that compound for that population will be funded. Oh, sorry, hmm, I think format, formatting error com, comes in this slide. Anyhow, uh, but I want, want, really want to tell you is the story about how 
open can really translate. One thing that is very interesting is that the same kinase is found mutated in 20% of a very rare brain cancer here in the pons. It's called diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, the IPG. Instead of these guys, and it's actually the same mutation as the CVR1, the, the stone man syndrome. But instead of these guys going everything from scratch and wasting six years, they call Alex. Hey, Alex, you have those assays. Can we use it? Yeah, of course. Immediately, that reduced it six years. So much so that we immediately took the outputs of that disease foundation work into the second disease foundation, brain tumor charity. That started clinical trial. But interestingly, the saracatinib that was found does not prove to be very efficient in the IPG. So what did Alex and now our colleague Al Edwards did? They started a new pharma. Okay? So I'll tell you a little bit about it uh, uh, at the end of the talk. But what I want to share with you is that when you work in the open science, any project under the SGC, that one funded by Wellcom, this one funded by Alzheimer's Research UK, this one funded by the European Commission, this one funded in Brazil, which actually looks at the interface between plant and human biology. Any target, any asset can be circulated, can be reused. We expand the possibility of cracking the biology. And best of all, we encourage all of our postdocs. And because these foundations, they don't care about how many papers they publish. They just want to see the result fast and shared with the community to raise awareness and bring new scientists to new areas. Was Veronica was very keen to see. Imagine now that for younger generations, you remember the first compound that I told you, JQ1, the Burma domain one? We told every single chemistry company how to make it. Now, anyone can buy a sample of that compound for $50. That's cheaper than a textbook. So an undergrad with good idea can start his new research. And when they do publish their own lab notebooks every month, and we encourage our people to do so, instead of the partners, be it industry, being big professors, contacting their PI, they write directly to these postdocs. And that will really ignite new idea, no ownership to the PI, and really new independent research careers. But we also try to push, because we're open, on other directions. Again, taking the page from Jenny's presentation, it's not only doing the science with a little shell. We have to try to show policymakers that perhaps open science is useful, perhaps is driving economic activity. We know what this is, all, but we are not communicating to people who can make decisions and help us move this forward. So this is actually an email that we received from Jean-Claude Bergman. Uh, his nickname also is Jean-Claude because he's the man behind the European Open Science Cloud, which will be launched in two, years, two months' time. And he said, yes, you know, policymakers, just in case you have something, you have a short description of this. And we work with Oxford Martin School, which is a think tank in Oxford. And we just wrote a quick policy paper, trying to capture all these gains. Right? It's not quantified yet, but it's qualitative. It shows the direction of travel. And this is another program that we are, that are, I run with some other colleagues, where we are trying, where we employ an economist and IP specialist to try to map where the bottlenecks might be. The last story before the one minute paper comes up is the M4K Pharma. Dialing back to that slide from the IPG, the brain tumor, M4K Pharma is a brainchild of Alan Edwards. And what he wanted to say and what to do is one of the experiments. Can we push a whole drug discovery process all the way to patient in the open? They believe they can. This was launched about mm, a year ago. Uh, has all the supporters already, right? Even with Charles River and Reaction Biology Corporation contributing in kind as part of their corporate social responsibility. They are generating new compounds. They are working in assays with our scientists. And everything that M4K Pharma does this company is owned by this charitable trust. And the commitment is to make affordable medicines and open science and public good. And they actively do, we're missing here on the formatting, but they actively do uh, almost a responsible self prior arting. So every month, the science group discuss 
the science. It's broadcast live on YouTube. It is recorded, and you can watch it. Just search for M4K Pharma channel. I just didn't link it because it's such a long thing. You won't be able to uh, note it down. But every single month, they show all the different chemistry they generate. They give all the details to anybody who would like to see. Yeah? And the beauty is that, well, they just reserve the exclusivity of taking all the clinical data into disease, into the IPG, but releases all the physical assets as a known IP uh, resource to the community. Finally, we've been doing, uh, as Jenny again mentioned, that's, that's what we met, the thing that I remember. Uh, we had, led by the Neuro Institute, they actually started to capture what are the advantages of open science. And that includes, of course, increased quality efficiency of scientific outputs. When you make it open, like our postdocs are doing, we are sure that people are not trying to duplicate effort. If you look at projects that are ongoing, that feeling of, oh my god, I have to write fast because I'm a bit scooped, right? Same projects running in 5, 10, 20 countries because they all read the same papers, that would probably not happen. We can get people to think creatively and bring together all the information. Can accelerate innovation impact, I hope I've shown this. Because of transparency, can increase trust and the accountability of the research enterprise. But I'm just reading this. I think it's much better if you just go and have a look at this article, Ali Khan et al, 2018, on mniopenresearch.org. And again, just like Jenny, I will be sharing these slides afterwards, is everything is open and shareable. And finally, I'll just quick shout out to my new job, it's Action Against AMD. And I think this is a great example of what the charity sector is trying to do. We all live in a DIY world. My daughter got a 3D printer when she was 10. And she can make her own toys, she can make little, uh, little presents for her friends, and she just print them off, off the internet, right? Uh, and I think the society finally realized that it's not just a matter of scientists or pharma to do betterment of the society. It's not just the charity who are focused on research, but there are other groups, other communities who have the same pressing problems. Our, these are our four founders. Blind Veterans UK and Scottish World Blinded. Luckily, UK is not involved in many wars recently, but 80% of their beneficiaries have lost sight because of age-related macular degeneration. They can do better for the future generations? Yes, they can. Working together, they try to crack the problem. Thank you very much. I think we have one at the back. Oh, yeah. on a very expensive clinical trial? Like, why are they investing on something which they cannot patent? Ah, so the compound, the two compounds we release to the public domain, that is para art. But that is not the best compound to inhibit that target. A lot of people tell you that target, really, there's no value because anybody can come with different compounds. And some models will say, the value is in the chemistry. It is not. If the value is in the chemistry, then the farmer with the largest collection of chemistry will be the winner. You, know, you have to know which chemistry to use and pair with which target disease. And that's what the open tools can allow you to do. Once it approves that relationship, then the race can start. And that coming back to where the line lies, I think what the SUC approach has always been is try to push as far as we can with our funding, with our funders, with the evolving acceptance of what is open. When the SGC started, was just structure. And then we pushed to do compounds. And now we push to do human tissues, right? Uh, and hospitals. But once you see it out there, and people see, ah, that is a target. You have to target with compound X. Then you start having all the companies come with their own versions of the compound. It is exactly the same thing as when any pharma launch a new drug. The next day, I bet you my left arm, all the other companies were coming up with their own, their, own, their own version, and they escaped the patent like, it's water, it's easy. 
Okay? And then you have the best in class, or first in class and best in class. It's the same idea. So those guys that are going out of the gate first, they are the first one to test on different diseases. If they're the first one to the market with a better compound, they get that. And that's their feedback. That, that's, a, that, that's a win. But they didn't have to invest in all this very cost and high risk area of the risk in it. Thanks. Uh, Lee, you make it sound so easy. Um, how can we make pharma make it easier as well? Oh, I have, to, I have to be honest. Farmers are making it easier. I think the perception of farmers, especially when I was just in the academia, is that, oh, they are bad, they're big, they're just out of the money. Actually, it is a very big organization. As many big organizations, you have different ideologies within the same group. All of our friends in pharma, they put money of their own research budget into the SGC. And they make sure it is open, there's no patent. And when they work with the SGC and all the SGC labs and collaborators, it is not like, here's all the access you cannot see. It's really a dialogue, and that happens every day. Something that can only be get when you are, say, really, here, the activity is not see who makes the money first, who is the first to run away with the asset. It's creating the knowledge to raise the waters, and then the race can start. In the SGC, when we have farmers, we have 10 farmers sitting on the table discussing science like they were from the same company. And that happens every three months. You can imagine people coming from Japan every three months, head of research, Tetsu, coming from Japan every three months just to see whatever the SGC science board is going to need. That's value. And that's something that is very hard to buy. And most importantly, because everything that is done is open to public scrutiny, they know it is reproducible. One of the questions we've asked to one of our founders, uh, funders uh, back then, uh, Novartis, why do you fund us? Novartis never funds any consortium. We thought we were here that, oh, you're a great scientist. No, they said, because you're reproducible. And that means a lot for us. So you talked a lot about the openness in the discovery and the development phase, but then when you come to the market, right, some mm -hmm. of the treatments are extremely expensive. I, I mean, I heard yeah. that a treat, to treat uh, uh, melanoma at this stage with cancer immunotherapies costs around one million pounds, right? So how, how, I mean, these treatments then are not accessible and not open to the majority of patients who can't afford the treatment. So are there any thoughts about moving into that kind of problem? So the M4K, great question. Thank you so much. And that's why we're so interested in the affordability of medicine, right? So we can we always try to push the envelope. We come from just solving the structure to chemistry to assays, right, and, and pushing on. Now what Al is trying to do with his little pharma experiment is show people there is a way to actually get to the clinic, get to the patient and find approval without having to have a profit, making money. And that's the difference. Uh, once that path is paved, then everybody can start adapting that. That's what always happens. You have trailblazers and then people adapt to their own situation. Also, another important thing to learn is that, again, we're breaking the monopoly of farmers. You will see now more and more CRO, contract research organizations, uh, academia, right? And many charities, disease foundations, taking the matter into their own hands. And sometimes they will hold, perhaps at certain stage, IP, but not because they can make it a cash cow, but because they can then define, define how much we charge to the patient group, okay? So we're looking at a very exciting time. Everything is up and turn. And I think if we think on the societal benefit, we can play important roles in reshaping that. 